Now, do you have any questions? Excellent. How do you and I make our lives easier down here? Well, the Hindus uh, came out with this tradition called the Vedas, and there are four of them. Before I tell you these four different traditions, let me just say what the Veda, the word itself means. It means secret. That's what the word Veda means. Now, you need to ask yourself, why would anyone keep anything a secret? Why? Imagine you have a two-year-old, and as they were walking around the lake, they heard someone use, or say, pornography. And let's say a two-year-old comes to you and says, Mom, what's pornography? Well, are you going to tell them? And if you are, how are you going to tell them? How much are you going to tell them? What things are you going to reveal and what things are you going to keep a secret? We keep things secret for a couple of reasons. Now, for those of us in this class who have children, and because children are pleasure-driven animals, they eat too much ice cream, they get a good spanking, they have too many candies, they get a spanking, so what happens to them? Because they know having candies or ice cream will result in them getting spanked. When the parents are not looking, they open a drawer or the fridge, they grab a bucket of ice cream, they take the bucket under the bed, and they eat the whole thing. And then you ask them, where have you been? I was reading the Bible. Really? You're only two. Yeah, I'm a genius. And then two weeks later, as you're vacuuming, you say, oh, what's that bucket of ice cream doing down there? And then you realize, why do we lie? It starts at a very, very young age, and it's natural. Because without lying, you wouldn't get far ahead in anything. The most important lie is, I am intelligent. My opinions are really good. I know I love my boyfriend. It's all a lie. But it gives you some pleasure. You'll get caught, if not by another, by yourself, definitely. But for those of you who may one day raise your hand and say, I no longer want to lie. Not possible. You need to lie. Okay? But we also keep secrets for different reasons. If You go home and your companion looks at you and says, how do you feel about me? Well, damn, you've been with him for about two years or three years. What are you going to say? Oh, honey, you're stale now. Yeah, you know, two years ago when I looked at you, I was inspired, excited. But our relationship lives in time. And time oxidizes everything. I look at you and I feel nothing. Zero. I don't want to let you go because it's nice to watch a movie with someone. So you know all of that, but you keep it inside. It's a secret. Because you know that truth hurts. You also know that the other person doesn't have the capacity to hear the truth. And even if they were able to listen to your truth, you wouldn't know how you would react to the pain that you have caused them. The other is, some, some of you in this class are friends, they're very good friends of yours, you've had them for about 15, 20 years. You tell your secrets only to them. You choose the ears that you want to whisper your truths to. And that's what the Vedic tradition is all about. 
It's not for the common person. It's definitely not for the masses. Now, there are two things you need to understand about, I suppose, communication of any kind. There is the exoteric and there is the esoteric. There is the exterior and there is the interior. And it's something that women possess really, really, really well. That there comes a point where a woman looks at her companion and says, yes, I know I'm attractive. Yes, I know I have a beautiful body, but you need to know I too have a soul. Once in a while, it's not a bad thing for you and I to sit and have a deep, reflective conversation. You know, I can think. So what you have in the context of exoteric exterior is that you give it to the public. And the public creates rituals. It's what they call tradition. You know, it's like us. It's a tradition. You sign up for a class. You need three units. You fall asleep. You daydream. You are here for grade. That's the exoteric. And you pretend that you're listening and you're paying attention and all that. The esoteric, the interior, is something very different. But you don't really care for the grade. You don't really care for the information. What you care about is the inspiration, the way the information makes you feel. Okay. So the teachers of the Vedic tradition knew that the public needs a GPS. But there are certain folks who look at, who enjoy looking inside what's in it. Now, there are four different secrets that the Hindus, the rishis, or the seers, or the teachers gave to their people. The first is called Rig Veda. If you are a Christian, the only path you have really is Jesus. If you are a Jew, the only path you have is Moses. If you're a Muslim, the only path you have is Muhammad. If you are a Hindu, you have approximately 400 million gods to choose from. It's really up to you where you are in life, what your interests are, what your capacities are, what moves you, what inspires you. Because at the end of the day, they argue, all roads lead to the same place. But you just have to be on the path the right way. Now, Rig Veda is like going to Costco. Costco is a huge warehouse. It has a million different aisles. They have millions upon millions of items on the shelves. You can, it's like a zoo. Instead of taking your kids to Great America, just take them to Costco. 7-Eleven also has items. They're just small. They only have maybe a thousand items. Most of the things you see are stale, look bad, smell bad, taste bad. And you get bored relatively quickly. What the Rig Vedic tradition argues is the following. Since most of the names of the gods live in that particular tradition, the more names of these gods you know, just in case you find yourself in trouble of some sort, call on them. There's a place in Chico, um, it's, you guys know where Chico is? It's an awful place to be. It's 
so there's a monastery somewhere out there and it usually, they have a long waiting list. And so you have to kind of sign up and be on the wait list. And after two, three, four, five, ten 10 years, they'll call you and say, well, we have an opening. You give them some money. They give you a tiny little room with no sink, no bathroom, nothing. There is a wooden, old, smelly, stinky bed. There's a cross above the bed. And every morning you have to wake up at 3.30, 4 o'clock. And then you have to write the Jesus prayer on sheets of paper. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on my soul, a sinner. And you have to write this over and over and over and over again from 4 until about 6.30, 7 o'clock. And then you go to the main hall. And then you have to listen to all these chantings. And then they give you like a piece of bread. But the point I'm trying to make is when you have access to the names of these gods, and since Hindus believe that different places in the human body houses different gods, and each god has a different function, the more you know the names of these gods and you know, the more you know their function, just in case you run into difficulties, you can call on these gods and hopefully they can come down and help you. But remember, up to this point, your problems, your issues are going to be revolving around either Kama, Artha, or Dharma. There is no enlightenment. There is no moksha, there is no salvation, except that you want your life down here to be better. So you use these gods to make your physical life more livable. The next is called Soma Veda. You know, I come to class and I talk because I have a lot of information in my head. My wife doesn't enjoy listening to me. She hates my voice. My kids find me pathetic. Every time I call my dad and I want to talk to him about philosophy, for some strange reason, the phone hangs up. And then he says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't pay my bill. The truth is I don't even find the information I have in my head interesting. So when I talk, I'm just using my tongue. I have no feelings about any of these ideas. I certainly haven't reflected too much about the stuff I talk about. And that's the first stage of speaking. You speak, but there is no reflection. You speak, but there are no feelings. You just speak because that's what we do. It's called chatter, gossip. And 95% of life revolves around gossip. That's what I do. I come to class and I gossip about things I haven't experienced and I don't want to experience, I have no desire or interest in experience. Then, once in a while, when I speak about this stuff, I find my emotions on the inside to be shifting and moving a little. In fact, sometimes when I talk, I inspire myself. And then when I speak, I realize my language is seasoned differently. And when my language is seasoned through emotions, because these ideas just impact me in such a way, 
I realize that something about me has changed and that change impacts the people, my audience. It's like the emotions baptize me. It's like alchemy, it's magic. And then through me or through my speech, other people are impacted, those who are receptive. But if you were to ask me, can you clarify that particular concept or that particular idea? The tragedy is, I'm just inspired. I haven't really reflected on them. I haven't opened the concept to see what lives inside of it. My inspiration is cheap, it's hollow. It's like my kids loving Sonic. All of a sudden I fall in love with an idea. I just don't know why. So remember, it's not enough for you to get to know the names of the gods and their function. You need to feel them. But there comes a point where you just get tired of feeling. You say, I want to understand. And the problem with ideas graduating or moving up the ladder from your tongue to your heart, emotions, and then being baptized by your reflective abilities. You say, I want to understand now, not just to feel. You say to yourself, I have been engaged in feeling these ideas for the past five years. How do I begin to understand them? Well, when you do anything for a long period of time, you begin to develop some habits and overcoming any habit is difficult. So someone needs to train you to detach yourself from feeling. And now what happens is you look at an idea, you unpack it and you see what lives in it. And every time your feelings come forth to sabotage, your desire to understand, you have to be mindful enough, aware enough to push it aside and say, no, I don't want to feel, I want to understand. So remember, first is the tongue. You speak without feeling or understanding. The second stage is you feel, but you don't understand. The third, you begin to understand and you're in awe of what you understand. And your understanding now creates a unique set of emotions. But for you to be able to understand anything, detachment is key. You can't be an emotional junkie. Okay? So remember, first you speak without feeling or understanding, then you speak with a lot of feelings and animation, then you speak with a good amount of understanding and that understanding contains a lot of intensity, a lot of emotions. Then there is a third stage, a fourth stage, where you realize that you're really not in charge of understanding anything or wisdom, and you're not really in charge of inspiration. It's the muses, it's the gods that will inspire you, that will give you understanding. And by the time you get to this particular stage, you read specific books, you speak specific conversations, and you talk to specific people. You're not a prostitute. You don't just sleep with anyone. You don't open the door just to anyone. You don't care for people being curious. Curiosity that goes hand in hand with responsibility and readiness to receive and to become monogamous. Okay. Now there is a Persian poem, it's by Abu Sayyid Abu Khair. چون دایره ما ز پوست گوشان تویم در دایره حلقه به گوشان تویم گر بنوازی 
ز جان خروشان تو این ورنن بازی هم از خموشان تو این During the semester I come to school around 5 o'clock in the morning I make myself a cup of coffee and turn off the lights and write until my first class around 9 o'clock But what's interesting about my office is the following. My cup sits there. If I don't go into the office, my cup doesn't text me or email me or complaining. It just sits there. But when I go there, it's ready for me to use it. It's passive. It allows me to use it the way I see fit. If I want to look at it, it says, okay. If I want to dismiss it, it says, okay. And that's the poem. <sighs> that I'm like a drum. If the drummer, and this is a great, proficient, spiritual drummer. If the drummer slaps me, I will intoxicate my audience. If the drummer doesn't look at me, doesn't pick me up, doesn't slap me, hit me, I'll be okay with being silent. The fourth stage is there is nothing to read. There is nothing to talk about. There is nothing to listen to. I will sit and I will allow the muses to use me as they see fit. Okay? Now, the main god in Soma Veda, her name is Vak, V-A-C. There is a German philosopher by the name of Martin Heidegger. In regards to communication, language, he had argued that there are really only two forms of speech. One could be considered speech, the other is nothing but chatter. So since most of us just chatter, including myself, especially Monday through Wednesday from six to nine, Let me just say a couple of things about chatter, I mean about speech. I have known Bob for about 10 years, maybe 15 years, maybe 20 years. May I tell them a little bit? He knows both the Old and the New Testament by heart. If you tell him John, 2538, they'll tell you exactly what lives in that, those pages or chapters. But interestingly enough, despite the fact that I've known him for a decade or so, he has never really said anything in the class. Just, hi, how are you doing? I play chess. Maybe five or six words, that's it. Many, many, many years ago, Bob experienced something. It's something that Heidegger would call being unto death. When do we really think? When do we really authentically feel? When do we say things that have a great amount of value? Not when life is ordinary, not when life is comfortable, when you're troubled. But what sort of trouble? When you find yourself very close to death, when you realize time is slipping, you're getting old, that you want to make the best of the few last minutes that you have, all of a sudden you become very mindful, you become very aware. Where should I go? What should I do? 
And when you get to that particular stage in your life, you realize you're paralyzed. You have all these friends, the so-called friends around you, but you don't know what to tell them anymore. You have all this money, you just don't know what to spend your money on anymore. You have power, but it just feels so useless. Being unto death means you have this intense set of emotions inside you, but you try to put them into language, but they won't fit. So you slip again and again and again and again. And then, like Bob, you come to class, you raise your hand, and you ask a question. And in it, there are feelings, and there are reflections, and there is history. But here is one thing that he comes to recognize. He is a 60-year-old man. How can a 20-year-old kid understand what he's talking about. A 20 year old kid can't. So you know what he does? He remains quiet. He doesn't say a single word. Being unto death. And should he find the right person? Then he speaks. And the right person is someone who's gone through the stuff that he's felt. He's gone through the stuff that he's reflected on. Now he breaks bread, emotionally and intellectually and even spiritually. It's not just chatter. It's not hollow. It's not meaningless. So Soma Veda. That once in a while, all of us in this class are captured into speech that all of a sudden you begin to listen to the way you speak and you are even in awe of what sort of animal you've become in that particular moment in time. Okay. The next is Yajur Veda. And it's the secrets or the Veda of sacrifice. The thing you need to know about sacrifice is this, it is most unpleasant. Genius don't have to sacrifice. Magnus Carlsen, the chess champion for a decade, he comes out of his mother and he says, I don't care for my dad, I don't even care my, for my mom. Where is the chessboard? And the mom says, you were just born, that may be so, I need the chessboard. Mozart, he doesn't need to sacrifice. If you are in the cradle of passion, the passion will drive you. Sacrifice is not necessary. Sacrifice happens when you have this pleasure, but there is another pleasure you want to pursue, but they run in conflict to one another. Now the question is, which is going to win? Pleasure A or pleasure B? Pleasure A is quick. Pleasure A is familiar. Pleasure A is familial. Pleasure B, on the other hand, is unknown. It's a mystery. It makes you feel good, but you're just not sure. But to go with pleasure B, it means you have to sacrifice pleasure A. If that's a little too difficult to grasp, imagine you have an assignment tomorrow and what you get in your essay tomorrow will determine your standing in this class. Tomorrow is 4th of July. Tomorrow your family is coming over. You're going to have fun with your friends. You guys are gonna go swimming. You're going to go smoking, you're going to go drinking, and maybe some of you desire to get lucky. 
But there is also this other kind of pleasure that's long term. That you need to write an essay. It needs to be about 15 pages long. What, which one are you going to choose? Pleasure A or pleasure B? And the thing you need to understand is this maturity, intellectual, emotional maturity, happens only when you're able to sacrifice something that you have, something that you're familiar with, for something that's unknown. And you must always sacrifice something that has value for you. Let me, since our friend there talked about the Abrahamic religions, let me say the following. If you want to understand what sacrifice means. Abraham is an old man. Abraham is a man who doesn't have any children. Abraham is a man who's always yearned, longed to have children. Eventually, God answers his prayers. One morning, Hagar, an Ethiopian maid, goes to Abraham and says, I'm pregnant. Okay. He's excited. Who is his son? Isaac, I'm mean, sorry, Ishmael, in the Islamic tradition. If you're a Jew or a Christian, it's Isaac. You have waited 90 long years to have a child. You're also devoted to God. Now, good teachers will never ask you to sacrifice something that's cheap, something towards which you're indifferent, you don't much care. They will always ask you to sacrifice something that's meaningful and valuable to you. If you're a Muslim, you have to pray five times a day. And so you have this prayer rug. For the past 20, 30 years, what you do is you stand on this tiny little rug and you pray. But all of a sudden you get yourself in this particular spiritual stage where you just don't want to say things without feeling them. You don't want to say things just to feel them, but you want to understand. And so you find a teacher, a sheikh of sorts, and the teacher comes to realize that every time you go to his house, you also take your prayer rug. He also knows that as a Muslim, you can't drink. So as you're about to pray, he says, wait a minute, I'll be right back. He comes back big with a big bo bottle of vodka or red wine. And as you're about to do your prayer, he says, oh, can you drink some? Also pour some on the prayer rug. He doesn't say, give me your shoes. He doesn't say, give me a buck. He looks at what you're most attached to. And he says, you need to sacrifice those things for me. So God looks at Abraham and says, you can't love two masters. It won't work. Do not believe Jesus loved the world. He didn't. He came here to change it. He loved one world and you want to change the other. Okay, that's what good teachers do. Now, what does Abraham do? Or what does God ask? God asks Abraham, give me your son. Are you kidding? I waited 90 years. Well, do you want me or do you want your son? Well, I want you. Well, if you want me, give me your son. Point is, maturity, spiritual development, Intellectual refinement only happens in sacrifice. And whenever you want to make any sacrifices, there's a good amount of conflict, doubt, disbelief, fear. There is no other way.
Is that the right time? All right, let me just wrap this up. So tomorrow we can talk about something else. After a few hundred years, the Hindus come up with yet another stage. It's called moksha. That there is a way out of this mess called life. There is a way out of physical pleasures. There is a way out of the pleasures that's given to you through power. And there is a way out of the bondage of having a family and having responsibilities. But this complete release from life demands one thing. That you find yourself a teacher. This is called Upanishad. Upanishad means, very simply put, you find a teacher, or a teacher finds you, and it's usually, I don't know if it's fated or it's accidental, I'm not quite sure how it goes. But the word Upanishad means you sit at the feet of your teacher. Soren Kierkegaard, the 19th century existential Danish philosopher, has a book. You don't have to read it. It's really not interesting. It's called Fear and Trembling. I was this 18-year-old kid. I was taking a computer science class at American River College. And I sat next to this Persian girl. Later on, of course, when she was like 20, she was diagnosed with cancer, and then uh, a year later she passed. There was something very attractive about her, and I remember sitting next to her doing my own work. And the truth is, I wasn't doing work, I was just wanted to sit next to her. And I remember my body just shaking a little bit because I was so nervous. Fear and trembling for Kierkegaard is you can't approach wisdom or your desire for wisdom. You can't approach teachers or desire, the desire to be, find a teacher casually. When you do find a teacher, you need to understand the sort of magic that lives inside them. They have the perfection of the gods. They have the beauties of the gods. They have the wisdom of the gods. You are in the presence of something profoundly awesome. Which means that when you are in the presence, you need to be shaking inwardly. You need to be filled with trembling, with fear. If that is a little too difficult to grasp, imagine that you love your mom or you love your dad, you love them both, and you go home and they're waiting for you to give you this news. Son or daughter, I have cancer, stage four, diagnosis, two weeks. You shake, you fear, you're in the presence of something awesome. The eternal disappearance of your father or your mother. You can't be casual, you can't smile, you can't laugh. Now I remember when we talk about teachers in India, this is a 5,000 year old tradition. You know, the mind of a 200 year old Westerner has difficulty grasping this. It doesn't live in the culture. 
Okay. Do you have any questions or comments before we go home? No one? Go ahead. The Vedas are sacred texts. We don't know who wrote them. Uh, they're kind of like the Gospels. No one knows who wrote them. But they've been floating around, and they are there to kind of assist you, both physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually even these days. But originally they were there to kind of familiarize you with gods, their function, how they can help you in your physical daily life. Upanishad is very different. Upanishad is... You've drank, you've smoked, you've had sex, then you've taken yourself a bit seriously, you put yourself through school, you save some money, you buy a house, <clears throat> then you become a bit more serious about yourself, about your mind, about your emotions, about your body. You go out and you date specific people, um, and then you get married, and then you have kids. And then you realize that it's not really satisfying you now, up to this point, <clears throat> it's all about your physical life and very much like a salmon fish. At a certain point, you say, I've done all the stuff, but to no avail, I'm miserable. <clears throat> now your questions can be, the answers to your questions can be found in books. They can be found in, in a traditional way. You have to kind of go on the ground. You have to cult. Called, you have to find someone who's able to cultivate your soul. In other words, you have to dig up the garbage, trash them, okay? And then put some nutrition in your land, in your interior, and then plant seeds. And then care for those seeds. And then watch them grow, okay? <clears throat> that is what makes the Upanishadic age or the stage so difficult. Uh, in some ways difficult, in some ways not so difficult, because by the time you get to a place where you realize that nothing in life is answering or satisfying the yearnings or the longings you have within, automatically you're on this quest. And if you're lucky enough to run into a Socrates, you know, uh, the only thing Socrates can do, as we talked about the other day, is that Socrates uh, creates some physical environments that will create a good amount of pain, but the pain is no longer about your companion. The pain is no longer about your physical body. It's about your spirit. It's about your soul, basically. Uh, there are four kinds of teachers, but you can find all four different types in one. Um, I don't know how teachers are made. I don't know how wisdom is found. But such people just appear from nowhere, I suppose. The first path is yana, yoga. And yoga means the following, that there is you. There is something outside that's alien, that's foreign. And as long as there is a separation, there is no yoga, there is no marriage, there is no union. Somehow, the student must marriage, become one with the teacher. And the teacher has culture, has history, has language, has emotions, intellect, insights, and wisdom. And the student must marriage with the teacher. That's the only way yoga can happen. Union, it's a marriage, body, mind, and soul. You can't simply go to a teacher's house, but emotionally be detached from him. 
You can't just go to his house, be physically and emotionally attached, but intellectually you're too goddamn dumb to understand them. It doesn't work. Okay? Any questions before we go? And the other three paths, they're really quite uninteresting. Necessary, but uninteresting. So let's uh, be done for tonight. It's good to see all of you. Have a nice tomorrow. Enjoy your family. Yeah, there is no class tomorrow. See you Wednesday.